This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're continuing our broadcast from The Hague in the Netherlands, where we turn to Nobel Peace Prize winner Shireen Abadi. In 2003, she became the first Iranian and first Muslim woman to win the award for her human rights advocacy, in particular for the rights of Iranian women, children, and political prisoners. She was the first female judge in Iran, but she's lived in exile since 2009. Shireen Abadi is in The Hague this week for a conference marking the 100th anniversary of the International Congress of Women, when over a thousand women traveled here to call for an end to World War I. The event marked the formation of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, known as WILF. Well, this week, WILF has brought together a new generation of feminist peace activists at The Hague in the centennial celebration of their organization for a conference called Women Stop War. On Monday, Shireen Abadi spoke at the opening session about the threat posed by the self-proclaimed Islamic State. It's my honor to be interviewing you, Dr. Ibadi, today on behalf of our friends at the independent sector and President and CEO Dan Cardinali. I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you and share your amazing journey and human rights work with the changemakers watching us today. So to start, let's go back a bit and talk about your life before the Islamic Revolution in 1979. You had a very, very distinguished legal career Please tell us about that. I was born in a modern Muslim family in Iran. I went to law school in Iran. And after graduating from law school, I became a judge in Iran. I was one of the uh, youngest judges at the Ministry of Justice. The reason for that was that I liked my work a lot and I worked very hard at it. And uh, in a little while, I became uh, a presiding judge. Mm -hmm. And this continued until 1979, when an Islamic revolution occurred in Iran. So after the Islamic revolution, the revolutionaries uh, decided that judgeship was for men and not for women. And therefore, myself and other women who had become judges after I became a judge uh, all were demoted to administrative positions in the Ministry of Justice. However, my uh, license to practice law was suspended. I was not able to get a license to practice law for another eight years. And the reason for that was that I had written articles against stoning and cutting off limb, hands of the thieves, and uh, they wouldn't issue my license as a result of that. So what happened was that after eight years, I was able to get a license and I decided to focus on human rights and the defense of political prisoners. And I focused on human rights and women's rights. And I defended political prisoners in a pro bono manner. And since in Iran, women's rights were being violated, my focus was on women's rights, on children's rights, and on the defense of prisoner, political prisoners and prisoners of conscience. I know during those years when you were doing that work, you took on many controversial cases defending political dissidents, and as a result, you were arrested numerous times. Could you share a little bit about what that experience was like? Man, uh, at the time that I was practicing law, uh, the students of the universities uh, were on a strike uh, because of uh, freedom of speech, because of something that had been, some article that had been written in a uh, newspaper. And uh, the military, the paramilitaries, and the, uh, who were, of course, uh, supported by the government, raided their dormitory at night and started shooting and so one of them was killed and the others were injured. And so I brought a case against the head of the police and also the paramilitaries. And uh, I had a witness who was a very strong witness who had uh, seen the shooting and how this person was shot and was killed. But unfortunately, since uh, the judiciary is not independent in Iran, and it is uh, 
under uh, the influence of the police and the government or the paramilitaries supported by the government, instead of listening to my arguments, they arrested me and the witness oh. and they put, put us both in prison. I received a punishment of one and a half years in prison after being tried superficially. And however, due to my fame, both nationally, due, because of the books that I had written and internationally, there a lot of noise happened around that. Uh, I appealed the matter. And uh, after the appeal, my punishment was reduced to a fine. So I paid the fine and got out of that case. However, unfortunately, my a witness had to uh, suffer the punishment. He did his time in prison. And although he had seen uh, what had happened and he was a strong witness, uh, no one ever listened to what he had to say. Holy cow, my oh, goodness. Um, well, your career has been so incredible. Uh, your work has been so courageous that eventually you were awarded the Nobel Prize. And I'd love for you to describe the experience of being war awarded the Nobel Prize um, and being the first Muslim woman to ever re receive the Nobel Prize and being recognized by the whole world for the work you had done. What was that like for you? Um, enjoy is the this prize was not only a prize given to me, but it was given to all Muslim women who were activists, who fought for their rights, who were uh, working hard uh, for their rights. So I uh, look at this as a prize for all women Muslim activists. Mm, fantastic. What would you say is needed now and critical now to support women's rights in Iran and particularly in Iran, but also in the Middle East? What would you say is really needed now? Women both in Iran and in the Middle East uh, are very active. Uh, we in Iran have been able to change a few laws uh, for the benefit of women. However, we have a long, long way to go till we reach equality. Mm. Um, let me turn to the Nobel Women's Initiative, uh, which I'm proud to be part of. You played a very significant role with our friend Jody Williams in establishing the Nobel Women's Initiative. Can you talk about how the Nobel Win Women's Initiative work has made a difference in bringing attention to and empowering grassroots women's movements around the world. Uh, in 2004, there was a conference in Kenya uh, on landmines. And since one of my NGOs in Iran was uh, working on landmines, I had participated in that conference as well. And it was at that time that Wangari Matai had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. So it happened that three women who had won the Nobel Peace Prize were uh, together in Kenya. And so I was talking to Jody and I told her, you know, there are a few of us uh, women who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. So why don't we get together and form uh, an NGO? And uh, she agreed and she said, it's a good idea. And then we talked to Wangari about it and Wangari agreed as well. So we uh, contacted other women who had won the Nobel Peace Prize and asked them to join us. And it took us a year and a half uh, to form the uh, organization and we started our work then. Uh, so our focus is not only on women's rights, but we're against war as well. Uh, we think that women are the ones who suffer most in wars. Uh, some of them are killed personally, and a lot of them lose their husbands, their sons, their brothers. So they are uh, the real victims of war. 
And these grassroots women's movements, I know that uh, are dealing with that, are supported by Nobel Women's Initiative in a, a very, very powerful way. So I want to just acknowledge and thank you for that, because that's a, 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 an act of uh, courage to support these civil society movements in these countries. Bale, ma سعی می کنیم از نورافکنی که روی ما هست به نفع زنانی که صدا ندارند کار کنیم. Nobel Peace Prize winners to become the voice of the voiceless. Uh, I will give you an example in this regard. A uh, few of us went to Bangladesh uh, to the camps where the Rohingya uh, refugees were located. And we talked to them and we interviewed them and we heard their stories, how they had been raped and their rights had been violated and their husbands and sons killed and uh, re uh, how they had been treated and had to escape uh, Burma. And after that, we went to the Truth Commission in Geneva mm -hmm. and we testified about what we had seen there and what we had observed and what we had heard. And I'm very glad that the ICC is now looking at the case. So um, let me ask you now uh, a little bit about COVID-19 um, and focusing on the Upswell Summit in October. Uh, that summit will focus on racial equity and the recovery from COVID-19. Hopefully we'll be through it, but we'll see. Uh, and you recently signed an open letter with over 500 political and civil society leaders, Nobel laureates and rights groups, including former U.S. Secretary of uh, State, uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and actor Richard Gere, stating that the COVID-19 pandemic threatens more than the lives and livelihoods of people throughout the world, but is also a political crisis that threatens the future of democracy. Can you speak to that and the important role of civil society in protecting democracy and our ability to recover from the pandemic? So, um, the statistics, when we look at them, prove to us that people who are uh, living in countries where the financial situation is not that good and the economic situation is lagging. And also people who are uh, in uh, first world countries, but they are not that financially well off, are uh, affected more by this virus. So in reality, what I'm trying to say is that this uh, disease attacks the poor people more. And we feel like inequality is going to increase as a result of that. And if there is a vaccine one day, or if there is a cure one day, or a treatment one day, that this may not go to the poor people uh, who live in this world. So this was a decision that we all made, and we wanted to make it clear to the world that if there is a treatment or a vaccine, that the poor people should have access to it as well. Wow, wonderful. Thank you for doing that and playing your role in all of this. Based on your experiences, um, what advice would you offer the members of the charitable sector um, who are viewing our Upswell pop-up conversation right now as they take on the challenges, the immense challenges, of racial inequity and recovery from COVID-19 here in the United States. در آمریکا مثل خیلی از Unfortunately, uh, neither in America nor in many other countries discrimination has been fought against. And uh, so the, the discrimination exists in many societies. If we look at the percentage of prisoners, for example, in the United States, uh, we see that people of color are more in prisons than white people. 
And if we look at higher positions, for example, CEOs at banks or other important corpora uh, corporations, you will see that the number of the people of color in higher positions is much, much less than the number of the white people. You can probably count them uh, with your fingers. Mm -hmm. Also, we, when we look at the death numbers as a result of the uh, coronavirus, we will see that people of color have died more than white people. Um, I sometimes think that we need another Martin Luther King mm. to uh, jump up and say, we do have rights too. Right. Yeah, we need probably lots of Martin Luther Kings now. The, uh, the depth of our challenges are are so uh, great and the response from our leadership so absent uh, in, in real uh, honest and authentic response. Um, so I, I wanna just thank you, uh, Shirin, I wanna thank you for your life, for your courage, um, for your absolute um, unyielding stand for the rule of law, particularly for women, um, and finding um, your way uh, to take the Nobel Prize and make it such a, uh, an, an asset for really hundreds of thousands, probably millions of grassroots women who have benefited from you receiving the prize and using it the way you have. Um, I'm sure the takeaways from your experiences will serve to inform the actions of organizations and individuals in the independent sector who are working to see their way through and recover from the pandemic, uh, from our uh, racial challenges here in the United States, and that all of this, which is impacting all of us around the world and to make a, a more just and equitable uh, place in the United States and around the world. It just, um, I bow to your um, resolve and determination, your bravery, your, um, your intellect, uh, your heart, your heart, and your deep, deep, deep commitment to create a better world for, for all of us. It's been an honor to um, speak with you today. Mamluna ba. Uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank uh, all the organizers for having provided me this opportunity to talk to you. And I also want to thank you, Shirin Urshadi, uh, for being the voice of uh, Shirin Ibadi for all these years as her uh, friend and sister and uh, colleague in law school, uh, and uh, making sure that we can uh, communicate with such a great woman uh, at this special time in history when her voice is so important. So thank you to you as well. Well, you're welcome. This is the least that I can do. Mm. Thank you. And I want to ask the United States and the Western world to throw books at people. You will see that we will have a better world in the future.